Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. This week's episode is an audio version of my most recent blog for Bloomberg NEF entitled The Unbearable Lightness of Hydrogen, and it's going to be mainly about the chances of imports being used to meet global demand. So let's dive in and get started. Two years ago, Bloomberg NEF published my two-part primer entitled Separating Hype from Hydrogen. On the supply side, I was optimistic Green hydrogen, that's hydrogen produced from renewable energy, would over time become cheaper than blue hydrogen, that's hydrogen produced from natural gas, but with the carbon dioxide emissions captured. Eventually, green hydrogen would become cheaper than grey hydrogen, which is hydrogen produced from natural gas without capture of the carbon dioxide emissions. On the demand side, however, I was more sceptical. While clean hydrogen will certainly be needed to decarbonize a number of use cases in industry and perhaps for long duration storage, I found it hard to identify any role for it in applications like land transportation or space heating. And since then, as I've done more work on industrial heat, I've come to believe it has a limited role even there. If my intention at the time was to inject some reality into the discussion, I clearly failed. Rhetoric around hydrogen has become ever more overblown. According to industry lobbying group, the Hydrogen Council, citing a series of reports they commissioned from McKinsey over the past three years, hydrogen can be expected to contribute more than 20% of emissions reductions needed for the world to reach net zero. It's a figure repeated by politicians and journalists, seemingly without the slightest critical examination. German Chancellor... Olaf Scholz has called hydrogen the gas of the future and promised a huge boom. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has declared that shifting to and developing a hydrogen society is critical for achieving decarbonisation. Franz Timmermans, the EU Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, believes that hydrogen rocks. And Jacob Rees-Mogg, briefly UK Secretary of State for Energy this year, called hydrogen the silver bullet. Public money is starting to flow. The EU has approved the first 13 billion euros, that's 13.7 billion dollars, of the 430 billion euros or 450 billion dollars promised under its 2020 hydrogen strategy and is now working to create a hydrogen bank. The US Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, provides a 10-year tax rebate per kilo of green hydrogen worth $3, which will soon be more than the production cost itself. Free hydrogen, anyone? In October this year, the Hydrogen Council and McKinsey released another report entitled Global Hydrogen Flows, predicting long-distance transport of 400 million tonnes of clean hydrogen and its derivatives by 2050, calculated on a hydrogen content basis. And that would be out of a total global production of 660 million tonnes of hydrogen. That would be seven times the 94 million tonnes of hydrogen currently used annually, virtually all of it made from fossil fuels and creating 2.3% of global emissions. The vast bulk of today's hydrogen never leaves the compound on which it's made, let alone crosses an international border. The idea of hydrogen imports as a way of decarbonising major industrialised economies is enormously seductive, so much so that Germany and Japan in particular have made it central to their decarbonisation strategies. Here's Japanese Prime Minister Kishida again. Japan aims to commercialise an international hydrogen supply chain by producing hydrogen in bulk at low cost in countries blessed with bountiful renewable energy resources coupled with marine transport infrastructure. Chancellor Schultz, meanwhile, is promoting hydrogen imports not just as a way of decarbonising the German economy, but as a replacement for Russian gas. 
In August, he and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau flew to Newfoundland and Labrador to sign an agreement to create a transatlantic supply chain for hydrogen well before 2030, they said, with first deliveries aiming for 2025. As I record this, the German economy minister, Robert Habeck, is on a five-day trip to Namibia and South Africa to secure hydrogen supplies. The problem with this vision of large-scale imports of hydrogen is that the physics of hydrogen is unlikely to play ball. In February this year, Kawasaki Heavy Industries' Suiso Frontier arrived in Kobe, Japan, carrying the world's first ever cargo of liquid hydrogen from Australia. Did this momentous occasion herald the start of a brave new world of trade in liquid hydrogen, as the press coverage suggested? In a word, no. Let's set aside the 500 million Australian dollar, that's 334 million US dollar cost of the project. Set aside the fact that most of the hydrogen on board the Suiso Frontier was made from coal, and set aside to the fire that broke out on board while loading. The 1,250 cubic metres of hydrogen carried by the Suiso Frontier contained just 0.2% of the energy content of a single large LNG carrier. Well, OK, the first ever LNG cargo carried 63 years ago from the Calcasieu River on the Louisiana Gulf to the UK consisted of a similarly picayune 2,475 tonnes. Surely liquid hydrogen can be scaled up in the same way as LNG has been. Kawasaki Heavy Industries, builder of the Suiso Frontier, claims it has already lined up the first order for a much larger 160,000 cubic metre carrier from Nippon Kaiji Kyokai. This is where the physics of liquid hydrogen step in. Although the scaled up vessel would carry 60% of the volume of an LNG QMAX carrier, it would carry just 22% of the energy. Here's the problem. Hydrogen has a very good gravimetric energy density. That's the amount of energy carried per unit weight. On this measure, hydrogen beats diesel, petrol and jet fuel by a factor of around 3 and beats LNG by a factor of 2.7. This is why it makes such a great rocket fuel. However, it has a very poor volumetric energy density. That's the amount of energy carried per unit volume. It's worth remembering that while a cubic metre of water weighs a thousand kilos, a cubic metre of liquid hydrogen weighs just 71. On a volumetric basis, hydrogen's energy density is a quarter that of jet fuel and only 40% that of LNG. Since ships are volume constrained, just think of the Suez Canal, the Panama Canal and so on, this inevitably means more trips. Even if Kawasaki Heavy Industries were to scale its hydrogen carrier to the same size as a QMAX, it would need to make 2.5 deliveries to carry the same amount of energy as one cargo of LNG. You don't need to know anything at all about shipping to know that 2.5 times the trips are going to cost you 2.5 times as much. But this is only the start. A liquid hydrogen carrier will inevitably be more expensive than an LNG carrier. Its load will be at minus 253 degrees centigrade instead of minus 162 degrees, and all pipes, valves, pumps and tanks have to resist hydrogen embrittlement. Also, because liquid hydrogen is both colder and lighter than LNG, the liquid hydrogen ship would have up to nine times more boil-off en route. Now, what is boil-off? These ships let some of their load boil off as heat enters the tanks, and they then use that as fuel for their own engines. So unless you add either much more insulation or a complex cryogenic recycling system, you'll have less hydrogen arriving at the destination. So overall, you'd be wise to assume that the seaborne segment of your hydrogen trade will cost around four times the cost of LNG per unit energy. But that's still not all. It only deals with the seaborne segment. We still have to talk about liquefaction and regasification. 
Liquefying hydrogen is a hugely energy-hungry process, made complex by the quirks of hydrogen physics. Things like its negative Joule-Thompson effect, because unlike most gases, hydrogen gets warm when it expands and cold when it's compressed. Or the need for ortho-para-isomer conversion, without which liquid hydrogen spontaneously re-evaporates, irrespective of how well it's insulated. Liquefaction of hydrogen currently consumes 30-40% to 40% of its energy content, versus no more than 10% for LNG. Now, ways to improve this are being researched, but nothing can change the fact that liquefying hydrogen is, quite simply, a bear. As for regasification, again, the plants will be more expensive than for LNG. They need to operate at lower temperatures, all valves, pumps, pipes and tanks have to resist embrittlement, and compressors have to be larger because pressurising hydrogen gas requires more work than pressurising natural gas. European politicians, scrambling to build new terminals to receive LNG in replacement of Russian gas, are suggesting that somehow these terminals will be repurposed to receive hydrogen or its derivatives. This is nonsense. You can reuse the docks and infrastructure, and any distribution pipelines can be upgraded, but 70% of everything else has to be scrapped. In summary, while LNG comes in at approximately double the cost of pipeline gas, shipped liquid hydrogen will cost four to six times more than LNG. In other words, you can't power an economy on imported liquid hydrogen. And that's not because of things that can be fixed – scale, technology, cost of capital and so on – but because of the underlying physics – volumetric density, liquefaction temperature and interactions with other materials. So, if importing hydrogen in liquid form is out, what about importing it as a gas? Here, things look much better. Gaseous hydrogen is already transported by pipeline. All the pipes, pumps, valves and tanks need to be appropriately engineered, but the economics are not terrible. Just as well, given the volume of hydrogen we're going to need at hydrogen hubs for industrial uses and to provide long-duration backup power. Remember that we have to replace those 94 million tonnes, the current production of grey and black hydrogen. Pipeline imports of clean hydrogen are well placed to meet a decent proportion of this. There is, as always with hydrogen, a caveat. The longest natural gas pipeline in the world, excluding side branches, is Brazil's National Unification Gas Pipeline, Gazun, just under 5,000 kilometres long. In their report on hydrogen trade, McKinsey and the Hydrogen Council predict 40 hydrogen trade routes, as they call them, connecting the globe. Those serving Europe by pipeline from Norway, from North Africa, from the Gulf, are certainly feasible. The one from Russia seems clearly off the cards for decades. However, none of the longer trade routes, linking the US West Coast with Asia, the US East Coast with Europe, or the Gulf, Africa or Australia with Asia are likely to carry a single cubic metre of gaseous hydrogen. There are a few companies proposing to carry compressed hydrogen by ship. This would allow them to avoid the cost and complexity of liquefaction, but would expose them to the same problems of lower volumetric energy density, only more so. Provaris Energy has designed a ship carrying hydrogen gas at 250 bar. But this translates to just 25 kilos of hydrogen per cubic metre, just over a third of the very poor volumetric density of liquid hydrogen. Scaled up to the size of a QMAX LNG carrier, their ship would carry around one-seventh of the energy. Seven ships to do the work of one. You can imagine what that does to costs. There may be some niche applications for shipping gaseous hydrogen, for instance, moving stranded supplies between islands, but it's not going to happen in more than homeopathic quantities. There are other ways of transporting hydrogen beyond liquid and gas. We'll get on to derivatives of hydrogen in a moment, but first I want to deal with the exotics, liquid organic hydrogen carriers called LOHCs and metal hydrides. Here, the goal is to load hydrogen into a chemical or metal carrier which allows it to be transported at ambient temperatures and pressures. 
On arrival, the hydrogen is released and the carrier returned to the point of origin. One promising LOHC is benzyl toluene, being marketed as a solution for hydrogen shipping by a company called Hydrogenius. But again, it has a volumetric density problem. One cubic metre of benzyl toluene can only be loaded with 54 kilos of hydrogen, which means four times as many trips for each energy cargo as you would have with LNG. In addition, loading hydrogen into the organic solvent is an exothermic process. It generates heat just where you don't need it, and then you need to add energy at 300 degrees centigrade at the arrival location to extract it, which uses up around 30% of the delivered energy. That's not to say LOHCs are not interesting. They are. They could perhaps find a role in long-duration stationary storage. Not everywhere has the salt caverns or depleted gas fields required to store gaseous hydrogen, but any tanker farm would be able to handle benzyl toluene, and there may be options to store and reapply the process heat between cycles. There may even be a modest import market for LOHCs to replenish long-duration storage tanks. Metal hydrides offer the hope of transporting up to twice as much fuel per cubic metre as liquid hydrogen. But each family of hydrides studied so far has shown disadvantages. Cost, gravimetric density, time to charge, absorptive capacity, heat required to release the hydrogen, and so on. It would be a brave investor who thought we were going to move hydrogen at scale this way when 50 years of research has not yielded a single commercial application. Next up, those hydrogen derivatives, e-methane, e-methanol. These are certainly easier to transport. Drop-in replacements for their fossil equivalents. Their problem is high production cost. For each of them, you need a source of clean hydrogen, whether blue, green, pink or red, whatever you call hydrogen from nuclear power, turquoise, whatever. Plus, you need a source of carbon nearby, and then you need to combine them into molecules of varying degrees of complexity. The cheapest source of carbon would be that captured from the combustion of fossil fuels. But that would not be compatible with net zero, because when the methane or methanol is eventually burned, it would end up in the atmosphere. The only thing that could possibly make sense would be to use direct air capture or to secure carbon from a bio-based source. So when the methane or methanol is eventually burned, it ends up where it came from. A bit of systems thinking, however, shows that even this makes no sense. Take e-methane. By the time you've gone to the cost of securing your carbon, why not simply sequester it? Instead of incurring further costs in producing hydrogen and combining the hydrogen and carbon into e-methane, then you could just deliver plain old fossil gas to the importing country along with a carbon credit if needed. That would be identical from a climate perspective and vastly cheaper. What about methanol? This can and must be made in future using clean hydrogen, and it would be easy enough to make it where hydrogen is cheap and export it, but this will only be done for use cases where it will be consumed as methanol. In 2022, Global production was 110 million tonnes. But you have to adjust for the molar weight of hydrogen within the methanol. And that means it's equivalent to just 14 million tonnes of hydrogen. Should demand double, and a third of that get traded internationally, that's only a 9 million tonne import market by hydrogen mass, which barely scratches the surface of the Hydrogen Council's 400 million tonnes. E-methanol also, of course, represents a potential pathway to decarbonise shipping, but ammonia and waste-based biofuels both look like being cheaper. Even, frankly, using nuclear power for the world's largest ships would most likely be cheaper than making e-methanol. And let's be generous and assume that e-methanol captures 20% of that market and a third of that is traded internationally. What about road fuels? Some continued to promote e-fuels as the solution for land transportation, particularly in Germany and Japan. 
They point to the fact that such fuels require no changes in consumer behaviour. They highlight the millions of jobs that depend on the internal combustion engine. And they claim that scrapping 1.4 billion internal combustion vehicles on the world's roads would be unaffordable. Their arguments have no merit. First, those 1.4 billion vehicles will all be scrapped anyway before whichever year countries select for net zero. In most cases, electric vehicles are already competitive on a total cost of ownership basis with petrol and diesel. E-fuels, by contrast, will still be three to five times as expensive in 2050, driven by their production complexity and by the efficiency losses at each production stage. Yes, I know Porsche is building a pilot project in Chile to produce e-fuels, but the volumes are tiny and theirs is not exactly a cost-conscious customer base. As for those jobs associated with internal combustion engine manufacturing, the sad fact is they will be disappearing anyway. The only question is whether they're lost to other technologies or to China. As for the point on behavioural change, most EV users like the fact that they can charge anywhere rather than having to visit a gas station every week. So now it's time for a deep dive into hydrogen's potential use in aviation. Airbus has said that it considers hydrogen to be an important technology pathway to achieve its ambitions of bringing a zero-emission commercial aircraft to market by 2035. And this month, Rolls-Royce and EasyJet made the news by testing a turboprop engine on pure hydrogen. It turns out that running an aircraft engine on hydrogen is not the difficult bit. The Soviet Union did it back in 1988, and the United States as long ago as 1956, and not on a test bench, but in the air. The real problems are caused, once again, by the physics of hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen has just 25% of the volumetric energy density of kerosene. Replacing the maximum takeoff fuel load for a long-haul aircraft would require more space than the entire swept volume of its fuselage, unless you completely redesign it from the ground up. For short-haul flights, the focus of EasyJet's interest, the fuel tank would take up around a third of the fuselage. But that means ticket prices 50% higher than now, even before paying for the higher costs of the plane, the cost of the liquid hydrogen itself, and the cost of its ground handling equipment. In total, you should expect a doubling or even a tripling of ticket prices. The real showstopper, however, is getting the fuel to the airport. Liquid hydrogen transfer lines exist, but they're short. There is no way to keep miles of pipeline at minus 253 centigrade and to handle the safety issues of any potential leaks. That leaves as options liquid hydrogen road tankers or gas pipelines. Let's do a little thought experiment with Heathrow Airport. Let's try to replace all 20,000 tonnes of jet fuel delivered daily with liquid hydrogen. The good news you only need 7,200 tonnes. By tanker truck, however, that would mean 2,300 daily movements of liquid hydrogen in West London. The safety and traffic implications don't bear thinking about. So the only option is to bring in the hydrogen by gas pipeline and liquefy it on site. But remember how much energy it takes to liquefy hydrogen? It turns out that that would require 2.7 gigawatts of electrical power, according to engineer and Oxford University ammonia expert Dr Mike Mason. 2.7 gigawatts is approximately the output of a new nuclear power station the size of Hinkley C, and you're going to need a lot of pylons. And then you need to dump enough heat to raise the temperature of the Thames by 18 degrees centigrade. The bottom line is that liquid hydrogen could perhaps end up powering a few executive jets, start up Zero Avia certainly hopes so, but not aviation as we know it. The only substantial role for hydrogen in aviation will be through the production of e-jet fuel. This is certainly technically feasible. UK company Zero Petroleum has already made some. But it looks like being at least twice as expensive as sustainable airline fuel, 
which can be made from agricultural or forestry waste. Now, if potential volumes of sustainable airline fuel are limited by feedstock availability, then there's a market opportunity for hydrogen in aviation fuels. And if not, there simply isn't. Now, global aviation fuel demand was around 300 million tonnes in 2019. That's just before the pandemic. But that translates into only 46 million tonnes on a hydrogen mass basis. Let's be generous. Let's say demand grows by 50% and 25% is met by e-jet fuel. And a third of that is shipped internationally. That only generates 6 million tonnes of traded hydrogen, nothing like the hundreds of millions of tonnes that we're led to expect. That brings us finally to ammonia, the last option for those hoping to develop substantial long-distance hydrogen imports. Around 190 million tonnes of ammonia are produced each year, mainly for use in fertilisers and chemicals, almost all of it from fossil feedstock. Around 10% of current production is already traded internationally, but this only comes to around 3 million tonnes by hydrogen mass. Switching to clean ammonia for fertiliser production will without doubt drive a big increase in traded ammonia and hydrogen. Where there are pipelines, hydrogen can be made where renewable power is cheap and imported in place of natural gas and used to make ammonia at the destination. Where there are no pipelines, green ammonia or even finished fertiliser will be produced and shipped instead. Supposing the fertiliser market grows by half by 2050, all of it goes low carbon and a third of it ends up being shipped internationally. That would increase ammonia trading from 18 to 94 million tonnes per year, a lot of ammonia. This would be a good outcome for those investing in ammonia projects in Chile, Canada, Namibia, South Africa and so on. Their output may not find much use in the energy sector, as we'll see, but at least they would have access to this market. It is, however, only 17 million tonnes on a hydrogen mass basis. Back to shipping, since ammonia will be cheaper than methanol, as we discussed earlier, let's be generous and say that half of the volumes that we've talked about are replaced with ammonia, and a third of it is traded internationally. That would create an additional 25 million tonnes of hydrogen demand we are still falling short of the hundreds of millions that we've been told about. What about ammonia in power generation? Japan is betting big on it. Its national decarbonisation plan is based on retaining its coal-fired power stations, but fueling them with increasing proportions of ammonia, first 20%, then 50%, then 100% by 2050. So confident is it and so keen to keep selling its coal power station technology internationally that it is encouraging Vietnam and other Southeast Asian countries to keep building power stations based on coal. Will that bet pay off? Let's do some system thinking, but we're going to have to do it in two parts. Let's look first at ammonia made from green hydrogen. That means generating wind and solar power somewhere cheap using it to produce hydrogen, which is 80% efficient, making ammonia via the Harbour-Bosch process, which is 70% efficient, liquefying it, which is 90% efficient, shipping it, 90% efficient, and then burning it to generate power, which is about 45% efficient. The end-to-end -end efficiency of all this will be an astonishingly poor 20%. Now, although it might be possible to improve the efficiency of each stage, you've got a problem. It's what I call the tyranny of multiple process steps. It means that your end-to-end -end efficiency is very hard to budge. And what 20% end-to-end efficiency means is that the resulting power must cost five times as much as the original power, and that is before accounting for capital invested in all those process stages and, of course, the maintenance. In addition, by the way, combustion of ammonia produces nitrous oxides, which are hazardous to health, and they are powerful greenhouse gases in their own right. You can avoid this by cracking the ammonia back 
to produce hydrogen at the place of arrival, the problem then is that the cracking also reduces your efficiency further. Now let's look at the other case. What happens if your ammonia is made from blue hydrogen? You eliminate the electrolysis stage of all those processes we've talked about. So your end-to-end -end efficiency is a little higher at 26%. But now you have the extra cost of carbon capture and sequestration. So the resulting power cost is going to be about the same. The real question, however, is why bother? Why not just ship the original natural gas to Japan instead of ammonia? LNG has 1.7 times the volumetric energy density of ammonia, so you need fewer cargoes. Then you can capture the CO2 at the other end, at the destination, and you can either sequester it there or send it back to the point of origin on the same ships. You've got the same climate impact, approximately the same cost of carbon capture and sequestration, but significantly greater efficiency and lower shipping costs. So the bottom line for ammonia as a fuel for power generation, whether you co-fire or whether you burn it pure, is that no economy can be internationally competitive based on the resulting power prices. My estimates are in line with the more detailed modelling work undertaken by Bloomberg NEF. The team there found that 100% ammonia-fired power in Japan would cost around $260 per megawatt hour in 2030 and $200 per megawatt hour by 2050. And that is around double the cost at which renewable energy could be generated in and around Japan. The fact that Japan could generate large amounts of renewable energy, in particular offshore wind, at much lower cost, in fact points to the role that clean ammonia could play in the country's power system, and that is providing backup. Bill Gates likes to quote Václav Smil on the three-day cyclones that hit Tokyo almost every year, which would shut down renewable generation and leave it short of 22 gigawatts of power. He laughs at the idea that batteries could ever fill the resulting gap, and he's correct to do so. However, that gap only turns out to be 1,600 gigawatt hours, which could be generated from a million cubic meters of ammonia. Sounds like a lot, but it's an amount that could be brought in on just four QMAX sized carriers. So while basing Japan's economy on electricity generated from imported ammonia is a non starter, storing a few million tons of ammonia and using it for long-duration storage looks a lot more realistic. This has been a long journey. We've covered a lot of ground. I want to leave you with a few conclusions by way of summary. First, the only way to move hydrogen economically is as a gas by pipeline. Forget liquid hydrogen. In fact, liquid hydrogen will struggle to find any role in the future energy or transport systems because of its poor volumetric energy density and difficulties of handling. It will have no role at all as an internationally traded commodity. Second, ammonia will be traded and transported primarily for use in fertilizer production plus as a shipping fuel. It will not be imported, however, to power bulk electricity generation, but it will be imported and stored to deliver long-duration storage. Some liquid organic hydrogen carriers might also be imported, but only where they are stored for resilience purposes and in much smaller volumes. Third, clean methanol will be made near to sources of cheap clean hydrogen and some of it will be shipped around the world for use as a chemical feedstock. E-fuels, whether methanol, petrol, diesel, kerosene equivalents, will not be shipped around the world in meaningful volumes because their cost will severely limit their uptake with the possible exception of aviation fuels. Fourth, Totting up the various future hydrogen trade flows covered here, it's clear that the Hydrogen Council McKinsey figures of 660 million tonnes of clean hydrogen production and 400 million tonnes of long-distance transportation are out by a factor of at least three. In addition, 
Given that China and India have only pledged net zero by 2060 and 2070, respectively, and that even the developed world will struggle to hit their net zero targets, such flows that do materialise will take decades beyond 2050. The implications of all this reach far beyond the question of international trade in hydrogen and its derivatives. The prohibitive cost of long-distance imports means that energy-intensive industries will inevitably migrate to regions with cheap, clean energy, the renewable superpowers, as I've called them in the past. It is inconceivable, for instance, for any country to import iron ore from Australia or Brazil, hydrogen from Australia, the Gulf, Canada or Africa, and to make primary steel at a globally competitive cost. Magical thinking will be no defence against deindustrialization. Finally, it's worth noting that none of this calls into question the fact that clean hydrogen will be required to decarbonise certain sectors, the sectors at the top of the hydrogen ladder, and this will eventually create more than 100 million tonnes per year of global demand. So, just as rail mania left the world with railways, electricity mania left the world with power networks, and the dot-com bubble left the world with broadband fibre, so hydrogen mania will leave the world with a lot of clean hydrogen. And that's a good thing. The worry is that along the way, we're going to waste huge amounts of money on the wrong use cases of hydrogen and the wrong infrastructure in the wrong places. Worse than wasting money, we will be wasting time. And that is the one thing we don't have. So let's be smart. So there you have it, the eighth in our series of cleaning up audio blogs based on my blogs for Bloomberg NEF. Once again, I would like to thank Bloomberg for letting me produce these audio versions. If you enjoyed this, you would probably also like the two earlier audio blogs on hydrogen entitled Separating Hype from Hydrogen, which we released in August 2021. Audio blog three was on the supply side, covering the various ways of making clean hydrogen, the colours and so on. Audio blog four was on the demand side and it explains the underpinnings of my hydrogen ladder. And if hydrogen really is your thing and you've not done so already, I suggest that you listen to episode 108 of Cleaning Up with Cambridge professor and co-founder of the Hydrogen Science Coalition, David Seabon, or watch the keynote I gave this October at the World Hydrogen Congress, which you can find on Vimeo. Next week will be the final episode of Cleaning Up for this seventh season. My guest will be Adair Turner, Lord Turner of Etchenswell. He was the inaugural chair of the UK's Climate Change Committee and has been chair of the UK Financial Services Authority and the Pensions Commission, as well as Director General of the Confederation of British Industry. He is now chair of the Energy Transitions Committee and he's an old boss of mine at McKinsey. So please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Adair Turner. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation.